Hey guys, welcome back. Today we're out the range with some classic military rifles. And when I say classic, I'm talking like 1860s classic. Here at the Military Arms Channel, we primarily talk about modern firearms, modern being World War I to present. A lot of World War II guns and a lot of modern guns have been featured here on the channel. I'm also a huge fan of black powder firearms, muzzle-loading firearms, and in this case, an 1861 Springfield, which is a rifled musket. This would have been the primary weapon of the Northern forces during the Civil War. We've also brought out some other weapons because I want to talk to you guys a little bit today about the history of modern warfare and how the Civil War really started to show how technology was outpacing tactics. Now, this 1861 Springfield I have here is imported by the Italian Firearms Group and it's made by Pedasoli of Italy. This is probably one of the nicest examples of a reproduction gun you will find this gun is approved for reenactments and it is a darn near perfect replica of the original rifle. Dare I say it's better made than the originals. This is a simply beautiful piece and the price reflects that. They're about $1,000. This is a 58 caliber rifled musket. And again, this would have been the rifle that would have been primarily used by Northern forces during the Civil War. But there was another rifle that came out that was actually would be considered by some today to be the assault rifle of the period. We'll take a look at it next. But first, let's fire this beauty. I have a 58 caliber mini ball in here with some black powder and cap, and we have a little target down range, and these things are surprisingly accurate. Beautiful plume of smoke and one classic military rifle. Let's take a look at what one of the most important developments of the Civil War was next the Henry Rifle. This, ladies and gentlemen, is the 1860 Henry Rifle. This rifle was developed just before the Civil War started and it was developed in the North. This rifle really was the proverbial game changer. This and one other rifle, the Spencer Rifle. The two rifles, the Spencer and the Henry, were competing as the top dog for repeating firearms. The Henry came about first, and the Henry brought about the lever action. Uh, this was borrowed from the Volcanic series of pistols, I believe, but Henry had a patent on this for the rifles, and again, it was developed in 1860, and was developed and produced throughout the entire Civil War. Production stopped right around 1866, I believe. They only produced about 200 of these per month during the war. Now, the, the original rifle was chambered in 44 rimfire, and it was Henry rimfire, and it would hold 16 cartridges. So it was a very stumpy little cartridge. It was rimfire. Think of a 22 long rifle rimfire, except 44 caliber in size. And it held about 25 grains of powder and had around a 216 grain bullet. So it was kind of a pud load. It wasn't exactly a powerful cartridge, but it held 16 rounds. This rifle scared the heck out of Southern forces the, the, the Confederates referred to this rifle as that damn rifle that the Yankees could load on Sunday and shoot all week because they were used to using rifled muskets or just muskets, which were muzzle loaders, much like the 1861 Springfield, which I showed you at the opening of the video. This rifle is capable of delivering very well aimed shots very quickly, and the original 16 to 17 rounds, if you topped it off with one in, in, the, in the chamber and 16 in the tube, this one is in 4440 and only holds 13 rounds. 44 rimfire went the way of the dodo a long time ago, so Henry chose to use the 4440, which is kind of a old west cartridge. It was originally a black powder load when they recreated the rifle. You'll notice one of the striking features of the gun is the brass frame. Now the brass is hardened, so brass can be hardened and it will hold up just fine, especially when using cowboy loads, which is what I'm using in the gun right now. It's a very beautiful, elegant rifle. The, the barrel is long, does not have a hand guard on it, which is kind of a unique trait. You can see the cartridges loaded there in the bottom, how they stack up nicely. Here's your brass follower. Now, the gun to be made ready to fire, once you've loaded it up, all you have to do is just run the lever and it chambers around. You can see the bolt right here. See how the bolt's holding that cartridge?
completely open top design, which brings me to another point. This rifle and the Spencer, which was slower to shoot, about the same to reload, the Spencer loaded through the buttstock. This rifle and the Spencer were competing against each other for the top dog in the repeating rifle uh, contracts for the, for the Northern Forces. And the Spencer was favored by some troops because it was more of a sealed action. It had a dropping, kind of like a rolling block action. And when it was ready to fire, it wasn't open on the top, exposing the internals of the gun to the elements. However, the Henry rifle was known for accuracy and reliability, and this is faithful to the original design. Let's do a little bit of shooting with this guy with its 44 caliber chambering. Ah, what's this? This, my friends, is the new Henry, uh, I think they call it the iron, but it's a steel framed Henry rifle. You'll notice it has a case, uh, case colored, case hardened receiver instead of the brass. Now for you traditionalists out there going, oh no, Mac, bring back the brass framed gun. The brass framed guns were the most produced, but Henry in the 1860s actually produced a steel rifle like this one. Only about 400 of the originals exist, and this is a reproduction of the original. This thing is my favorite of the two Henrys I own. I think the brass is beautiful, but brass tarnishes. You always have to polish it. This is just straight up case hardened steel, guys. Functions just like the original, still has the brass riser in it. You can still see the brass lifting block, still has the brass follower but it has the steel frame. A little bit easier to maintain and uh, just absolutely gorgeous rifle. And I also like it because it's a replica of a very rare Henry rifle. Now, another thing that's kind of cool about the history of the Henry rifle is that after the Civil War, these rifles, 1866 about then is when the production stopped, these rifles kind of gave way to modern Winchester designs and things like that, but these rifles were still quite prominent. There was quite a few of them out there, and they found their way west. As a matter of fact, the Cheyenne and the Sioux wound up using some of these rifles against Custard at his last stand. So these rifles did make their way out west and stuck around throughout the American West, even though more modern lever action designs came about. Another interesting note of history about these rifles is that the Northern troops had them, and the Southern troops wanted them. Keep in mind, during the Civil War, the Northern troops were, were from an industrial nation, the Southern troops were from an agricultural nation, and they didn't have the same manufacturing capabilities, and they couldn't knock this gun off. The Southerners did knock off Colt revolvers and other things like that. Many of them would have brass frames, uh, which wasn't desirable. It's just they, they made stuff with what they could work with, um, but they didn't knock off the Henry rifle. However, these were cherished prizes of war by Southern troops. If they could get their hands on them, they wanted them. However, they couldn't really get their hands on the ammunition unless they captured a bunch of the ammunition to go with the rifle. They couldn't manufacture it in the South. History goes, or the story goes, that Jefferson Davis, the Southern president, his bodyguards actually used Henry rifles when they were on their protective details. So anyway, it was a very, very feared, very, very desired rifle during the Civil War, and you guys can see why. This sucker can just shoot, 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 and shoot before you have to stop and reload it. Now let's go back and take a look at the loading sequence of the 1861 Springfield rifled musket as compared to the loading sequence of the Henry rifle. Let's take a look at how you would load the 1861 Springfield. Now, mind you, I'm not loading it like a soldier would have in the field. They had paper patches, which were self-contained cartridges. They take a paper patch that had the charged gunpowder in it and it had a mini ball held in place by a piece of string on the end. They would bite the end off the paper cartridge. They would dump the gunpowder into the barrel. They would then pull the mini ball out, set it on top, take the ramrod, seat the charge, cap the rifle, and shoot it. I don't have all the gear that a, to a proper reenactor would have, so I'm loading it as a modern muzzle loader would load the gun. I'm using a rather light charge. I'm only using 60 grains of FFG 
black powder. I have it pre-loaded, pre-measured here. Now, to load the gun, it goes like this. First of all, the gun's on half cock, and if you have been firing it in battle with black powder, you always have to be mindful that you might still have hot burning embers in the barrel, so you want to keep your face away from the muzzle, okay? And you don't want to use a powder horn or something like, like that to dump gunpowder into there because if you get the, a flash of powder coming up, you don't want to be holding a hand grenade of gunpowder, all right? So I'm going to dump my gunpowder, my 60 grains of powder in. All right, and now I'm going to take a mini ball, and this was a devastating development during the Civil War, another piece of technology that really changed the face of warfare. This is a mini ball. The end of it is open, and what happens when the powder starts to burn, the rear end of the bullet flares out and engages the rifling in the barrel. Unlike a musket, this rifle is accurate out to, some say, as far as 500 yards. It has the sights for that far, that type of distance shooting, which we'll try later in another video out at the long range. This mini ball was devastating. And the, the wounds that these bullets produced, modern medicine of the era, simply struggled to contend with. The Civil War was just a bloodbath because of tactics, improved accuracy in rifles, and higher capacity rifles that can inflict more damage more quickly. So then you're gonna seat the mini ball in the barrel. I'm gonna tap it and get it started. I'm gonna take my ramrod out. And I'm gonna seat the ball against the powder charge. Now the mini ball is about the same diameter of the bullet. You wanna make sure that you tap that all the way down. Don't leave any air space because that can cause a dangerous overpressure. Take your ramrod out, put it back in. Now, a soldier of the era that was well-trained could do this three times per minute and get a well-aimed shot off each time, so three shots per minute. Now, I'm gonna have to cap the rifle, and this was a definite improvement over flintlocks of the previous area, era of rifles. You put a cap on the nipple, bring the weapon to full cock, and now it's ready to fire. Did you notice a little bit of a hang fire there? That was normal for weapons of the era. Now, many times when you shoot this thing, it'll go off instantaneously. Other times, it'll take a little while for that flame front to move into the powder charge area and set the gun off, so you'll hear boom, like you did there. And a lot of times, these guns simply didn't fire. We've had that happen to us before out here, just this afternoon, as a matter of fact, where you have to recap it and try to get that powder charge to go off. It may take one or two primers to get it to go off. If it doesn't go off, you now have a bludgeoning instrument. It would have a bayonet that you could affix to the barrel, and you have a buttstock, and uh, that's what you're reduced to, because if you have a ball stuck in here, you can't load the gun in combat. You need another rifle, or you're doing a bayonet charge. All right, let's load it up again and do a little bit more shooting with it. I actually enjoy shooting this thing a lot. Eyes on for safety. You know, I don't even know if Civil War soldiers were allowed to shoot left-handed, but it's 2016 and we're allowed to do that now, so we're going to. Ooh, that was a delayed fire. My shot, my sights were on when I pulled the trigger, but then it, then I flinched. <laughs> That's too much fun, man. <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and up the powder charge to 70 grains of FFG black powder. Guys, I have to be honest with you. I am a black powder junkie. Um, I've just started collecting black powder firearms again. About 20 years ago, I bought, I bought a whole bunch of them, shot them all the time. And this Pedisoli 1861 Springfield, which I just got from the Italian Firearms Group, really has rekindled that interest. I also picked up an infield, which we'll bring out. We'll talk about the infield, which is a popular weapon with Southern troops. A lot of these 1861s were captured by Southern troops and used by the Southern forces against Northern forces, but the Southerners also captured the manufacturing capabilities for the old 1855 Springfield, the predecessor to this one. They modernized it, and I believe they called it the Richard Richardson or something like that. I have to go and look at my history books again. But they had their own version of this rifle. But because of embargoes and, and 
their inability to manufacture in volume, the South actually had to go to Europe to import weapons for their forces and the infield, the three band infield would be one such weapon, which I have a replica of from the Italian firearms group. And we'll bring that out and we'll compare this rifle to that one in a future video. Plus another thing I wanna do is show you the difference between balls and mini balls and ballistics gel. Stick around for that video here real soon as well. Okay, so I have my powder charge of 70 grains in there. I have my mini ball seated. I'm gonna take a cap and make the weapon ready. And here we go. So, a little bit of a hang fire yet again, but it connected with the steel plate. And what's funny is I went up 10 grains in powder and really there's no more recoil because the smoke kind of blows away. Dude, I just love black powder, it's just so much fun. But um, yeah, these things are absolutely gorgeous. If you take a look at this, this rifle, so look at the sights on this thing, okay? So the sights, that is a 500 yard sight and then right behind it is a 300 yard sight. And then right there is your standard battle sight. So these rifles were really good out to 500 yards. Now keep in mind, during the Civil War, they were still using old school tactics developed for muskets. Muskets were only accurate to maybe 50 yards. They didn't have a rifled barrel and they're just bouncing a metal ball down a long tube that may or may not hit a man at 50 yards. When we went to rifled muskets like this 1861, guys, I could easily hit a man at 200 yards with this rifle. It changed the nature of warfare, but you had opposing forces standing across the field from each other, all online trading shots with rifles now that could hit a man. They could say, I'm gonna do a headshot at 70 yards and pull it off. The nature of warfare changed with the technological advancements with the Henry rifle, the Springfield 1861, and yet they were using those old school tactics, which again added to the body count and, and the carnage of the American Civil War. In case you guys can't tell, I get kind of excited about the history of these firearms. Anyway, this is just a beautiful reproduction. Very, very proud of it. The markings are awesome. It says 1861 on it. Again, this is approved for reenactment. Look at the cartouche and the stock. Look how nicely fit all the screws are, the wood, the butt plate, US there. Just a simply beautiful rifle. Well worth the investment. We have the sling swivels, the three band. I believe it's walnut stocks. Just an absolutely gorgeous rifle and a ton of fun to shoot. So this is my first time shooting the Henry Iron uh, Rifle, the repeater, here in 4440. You just want to get a feel for how it loads. So you take the brass follower, bring it all the way to the top. There's a little detent, and you'll twist it uh, clockwise. And then I got 13 rounds here in my pocket. I'm going to load down the tube. Bolts facing forward or else it's not going to go off. And there we go. You just turn it, the follower engages, and you're ready to go. So we'll load it up. And... Oh, this thing has no recoil at all. There's the follower. So I showed you guys the sights on the 1861 Springfield and how they're set up for up to 500 yards. Now keep in mind, as I pointed out, the 1861 actually has a powder charge and a heavy ball that's capable of actually getting out there where the Henry rifle of the era shot a 216 grain bullet with 25 grains of black powder. It's a very minuscule amount of powder charge, especially off a long barrel. So here are the sights on the original Henry. Notice how they pop up and they're actually graduated to 800 yards. Now guys, I'm gonna go ahead and say that's very optimistic for a 200 grain projectile with 25 grains of black powder propelling it. Uh, more than likely, you're gonna be using this weapon at, weapon at much closer ranges. You'll notice it has a very nice blade front sight. It actually offers a very clean, nice sight picture, as does the 1861 Springfield. 
But I just thought that was kind of interesting how the sight was set up for 800 yards of shooting with such an anemic pistol caliber cartridge when we're talking about the 44 rimfire. As for the old 1861 girl, 70 grains of powder is about all you need. Now, you can't really truly overcharge the gun. I mean, you can if you fill the barrel halfway full of powder. Um, say you went to a 90 grain load, what's gonna happen is you're gonna have the powder on a mini ball, the gas pressure will start to blow past the skirt and it just won't get proper rifling engagement. So you just wanna keep the powder charge right around 70 grains or so from what I understand. Now I just put a 70 grain charge in there. I have a five, uh, a point, what is it? It's a point five seven five diameter bullet. I should be using lube. I'm out of the lube for the bullets. I'm, I'm running these dry. It makes it easier to load the gun if you run them with lube. Now, one of the kind of the nice things about the 1861, what it has over the Henry, keep in mind, remember what I told you about the Henry, it's shooting about a 200 grain bullet with 25 grains of powder. This rifle is gonna be accurate out to, some say 500 yards. The sights are set to 500 yards, but easily to 200 or even 300 yards if the rifle zeroed. The Henry with its basically pistol caliber isn't gonna be doing a whole lot of damage at that type of range. So the 1861 definitely had the advantage in the range department, just not in the speed of fire department. So we're gonna go ahead and cap this bad boy up. I hope you guys enjoyed coming out to the range and shooting these old Civil War classics. I have some more, which I'll bring out in future videos. And um, you know, we're gonna do some ballistics gel tests. I, I really do wanna kinda do some more black powder stuff this, uh, this fall and next spring and bring you guys along and kinda show you old versus new and show you just how devastating some of the older weapons really were, including cap and ball revolvers. All right, guys, if you have any questions about anything you've seen in this video, you can ask those questions down below. I do stick around for the first couple of days to answer the questions you guys may have. Also, if you would like to support the Military Arms channel, please swing by and check out Copper Custom. And check out Full30.com, that's Full30.com. We've taken all the web's best firearms content creators and brought them under one roof, and that is Full30.com. And yes, Hickok45 just did his chapter two on his 1861 Springfield. And trust me guys, I've been planning this video for a while. I'm not following Hickok. I mean, I follow him online, but I'm not copying him. Anyway guys, thanks for watching, and uh, we will talk to you guys soon. That was a serious hang fire. I think I need to clean this girl. <laughs> Watch this. I'm gonna go ahead and clear the uh, the embers out of here. I'm gonna cut my hands around the bore and blow. Blow smoke out and blow out any burning embers before I reload it. See you guys later.